ladies and gentlemen. Let me just take the music down a little bit. Here I am. <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, it is your friend, Mike Brady from Ocean Liner Designs. You cannot tell me how happy it makes me to be able to say that again after a pretty extraordinary week. Hello, everybody. Oh, so many of you already. 200 listening in straight off the bat. Good to see you all. How are we? I've got coffee at the ready. I'm ready to go. Once again, it kind of looks a little bit like I'm wearing wearing some lipstick. It's the um, it's the webcam, I swear. <laughs> Hi, guys. How are we all? Look at you all. Hello, 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 hello. Um, excited to do a live stream. Um, it's been the first time for a little while that we've done a fun catch up kind of live stream. The last one we did was about the Empress of Ireland and that was a more serious structured live stream and I wasn't on camera. So just in case you'd forgotten what I look like, here I am wearing a colorful tie. <laughs> we got a lot of people saying hi. Hello from Spain. Greetings from Belgium. Hello from New York. Lipstick man. Thank you for that, Mr. Herald. Yes, very funny. So many of you. Hi guys, how are we all doing? How are we? It's been a very interesting week, or two weeks, let's just say that. Uh, you probably all would have seen the video I did about the Titan submersible. I think, yes, it's totally fine to talk about it. I'm happy to talk about it. And yeah, I was pretty sad the other week, I have to say. It was a, uh, yeah, it was a sad week and I held off from doing a live stream. I actually had a live stream lined up for you guys that we had to scrap and there was like this whole Titanic thing that I had to scrap. But it's good to be good to be back. Regular programming. Look at this. We've got people from the south. People saying I'm looking sunburnt. Again, this Logitech webcam. Not a fan. From the United Kingdom. We've got people from all over the place. Greetings from Amsterdam. From Lino. Hi, Lino. Hello from Victoria. British Columbia, Canada. Hello from California. South Africa. Gee, it's amazing. I would love to have a map of the world right now. Just see, like, where you're all you know, pinging from, <laughs> it would be amazing. I've got a map that's a globe behind me, um, but it is unfortunately glowing as one light. That was extremely loud. I don't know if you guys heard that, but um, I forgot that I enabled sound effects for when people do things. And one of them is the sound of the Queen Mary's horn and it just blasted at me. And now I'm awake. I don't know if you guys are hearing this, but now I'm awake. Okay, we've got some super chats. Let's answer some of your questions. Let's dive into a good old fashioned ocean liner designs live stream. Here we go. Roberto Diaz Costa says, hi from Paris. Thank you for your channel and all of your videos. Thank you. And greetings back from Melbourne. I went to Paris in 2018 and absolutely loved it. Yeah, it's a, it's a spectacular city. Really enjoyed it. People often say things like don't you know, don't get your hopes too high for Paris. You know, they say that it's too romanticized and what have you. But I went there and was absolutely amazed, especially by the Eiffel Tower. I don't know how many of you folks on stream have stood. I know this isn't ship related, but it's a giant structure from the 19th century. And that's kind of our, you know, our remit. That's what we talk about. I was standing beneath the Eiffel Tower looking up at it like I was just dwarfed. It was, I did not expect it to be um, that big of a tower. I know it sounds ridiculous, but... I guess they don't tell you how big it is. They're like, oh, it's so romantic and beautiful and, you know, it looks fantastic there, but it's enormous. <laughs> Good to see you. Thank you very much. Titanic's fourth funnel is communicating with us from the bottom of the, uh, the North Atlantic, which we, uh, which we love to hear. I don't want to miss any of these. I, I always miss one. I always miss one. Classic. Titanic's fourth funnel says, Good evening, Mike. Have you read the book Sinkable by Daniel Stone? He dives into the Titanic and others as a shipwreck. Instead of a ship. No, I haven't. The more, the more I read about this stuff, the more interesting. The shipwreck kind of what happens to them after they sink um, becomes. You know, one of my uh, editors the other day said, hey, you should do a video on what happens to a ship actually after it sinks. Because you think about all that stuff that is in a ship. It's essentially a floating town. And you wonder about, you know, like Titanic was carrying literal tons of potatoes. There was a potato room on the Titanic. I don't know if... This is a fun little trivia fact <laughs> that you can shock your friends with. There was a dedicated potato room. It wasn't like just cold storage. It was literally a potato room. And you just wonder how long that stuff takes to break down. And then because there is more, 
food waste and stuff towards the stern of the ship in the in the galleys and things like that did that exacerbate bacterial growth and then the bacteria that ate the steel is there any relationship between the two of them it's well beyond my knowledge but no i will give that a read thank you very much titanic's fourth funnel um sinkable by daniel stone book recommendation we also just on the point of uh books i did get um some care packages just the other day from from fans and people who watch the channel who sent me some things um i'll go through one of these real quick i've got a book of uh sorry a, a, a box of books here from selena who's a long-term um supporter of the channel a big fan a lot of things about Isambard Brunel. So I don't know what I did to deserve getting three books and four books in the post. One of these was a, uh, a dictionary of RAF slang, which we'll go into in, in a minute. Because I don't know how many of you guys know I'm also a plane guy. But um, this is really cool. It's talking about the SS Great Britain, the first Atlantic liner. And then um, just a, a collection of things about Brunel's uh, ships in the port of Bristol. So I think I'm getting a, a fairly strong hint from Selena. It's almost like they're screaming at me from Britain to say, do a video <laughs> about Isambard Brunel, for goodness sake, Mike. So many of you have said it. Yeah. For those of you who are wondering what I'm talking about, Isambard Brunel was a genius uh, inventor, engineer, who started out in railways and bridge building and buildings, things like that. And then just essentially one day it was like, I oh, am what if I designed a ship? And then he did. And it was one of the most amazing ships ever designed for its time. It was very, very exciting. So thank you very much for that, Selena. And of course, um, a dictionary of RAF slang. And um, I will give you all... <clears throat> here's, let's try and find a, a fun piece of RAF slang. Here we go. Ah, here we go. B. We're in the B section here. B. Beef. To bore one's fellows by giving Queen Anne information or talking very dry shop. Apparently the definitions are also in RF slang, <laughs> which doesn't help much. Thank you for that, Selena. That was a lovely collection. Very nice. Look at that, guys. Instant library. How good. Thank you very much. And when I do do a video about Isambard Brunel and the Great East and the Great Britain, you know I'm going to be reading those books. Thank you. Uh, per Guerra gave us a euro. Thank you very much. Good to see you, my friend. Thank you for joining. Uh, Fat Produce says, White Star Line or Cunard, 1880 to 1934, which would you pick based on liners, interiors, and exteriors alone? I would pick Cunard Line. That's going to upset a lot of people. I don't know if many of you guys have seen too much of Aquitania or Mauritania or Lusitania's inside. Man, Aquitania especially was unbelievably beautiful, just gorgeous, big. And it's exactly my kind of aesthetic as well. It's like big, big whitewashed walls, like a gallery, you know, and like, um, you know, tiled floors, like beautiful, massive windows and just tons of natural light. There was beautiful, beautiful ships. So I'm going to have to say uh, Cunard Line. And I also hate to say it, but Cunard Line had probably a little bit more of a, a little bit more of a safety record there. No, yeah, it's, it's got to be Cunard. Berengaria. I don't know, Cunard, uh, White Star had Majestic, but Cunard just had the big ticket items for the longest time, you know. That said, you know, White Star Line's ships were pretty nice for their time, but they were just a little bit more cookie cutter. I don't know if you guys noticed, but White Star Line, Harland and Wolf, actually, this is more of like a Harland and Wolf thing, but they would often reuse design motifs and things from their older ships and just kind of like re appropriate them and rebuild them and make them bigger essentially so olympic and titanic were really just pastiches of past um <laughs> you know like the adriatic you see so much of adriatic's interiors in olympic it's quite it's quite funny good question i don't know if i just annoyed all of my fan base but there we go we're gonna say cunard line and i'm not sorry about it uh we have Sorry, I'm wearing my contact lenses and I think I need to get my eyes checked again because things are a little blurry. I have to get reading glasses out so I can see what's going on. Um, I think, is this Volpix Rossi, I think it is. Sorry, I, I, if I'm saying that wrong, I, I apologize. But Volpix Rossi says, I'm broke, but I like your channel, man, uh, Mike, so here. Thank you very much. That's uh, very much appreciated. 
the Patreon has surged. This week just gone. We'll we'll talk about the week that ha- that was in a minute in more detail. But um, yeah, it surged and people are really helping out and complimenting the work. It's not the Ocean Liner Designs Mike Brady show anymore, although I am the the front man who you see more of. Um, there's actually about like five or six people now involved in producing the videos. Obviously, I'm producing them and presenting them, but we've got a writer who's joined, which is really exciting, and she's an absolute legend. Her name's Sarah. And she does brilliant stuff and she really, really knows her things. And so we work together on scripts and I'm, we're going to be making the first Sarah written video this weekend coming, which is really cool. Um, you, you guys know Jack Gibson, the animator. I've got Liam Sharp, the 3D modeler. We've got some other people for something else that we'll need to talk about, um, which we will <clears throat> discuss soon. But yeah, anyway, very exciting. Um, as always, lagging behind on the Super Chats, Catherine... Ryan. Hello, Catherine. Hi, Kat. How are you? With 50 US dollars. 50 US dollars. Thank you. The point I was trying to make, by the way, classic Mike, going on a tangent, was every cent helps because now I'm kind of like, I'm, you know, paying people to, to make things and, you know, they're, they're doing really cool work. So I like to pay them fairly. And every little bit that you guys send really helps. <laughs> Kat says... Hello. I assume it says H E W L O A R, which I assume is like Australia. Like, hello. Uh, before you start drowning in super chats, I'd love to see a new book for the live stream because reading is what fundamental. Ah, uh, okay, fine, fine. Let me see. Let me see what I got. Okay. Now you guys can see how ill-fitting my waistcoat is. I'm getting new ones made up. We'll go with, uh, I'm going to find something we haven't spoken about before. Oh, that was a good one. Ah, here we go. Mark Chernside is a channel hero. We all love Mark Chernside. The Big Four of the White Star Fleet by Mark Chernside. This is favorite. I was just talking about how much of the Adriatic and these ships were in Olympic and Titanic. If you're interested in kind of where Olympic and Titanic came from, this is like requisite reading because Olympic and Titanic directly replaced essentially this, you know, this group of um, running mates and sister ships. And you can see so much of the of the other ships in them. Just the the layout, some of these rooms is is almost identical. You know, the furnishings and everything. Um, they're just a little bit smaller, but for their time, God, they must have been absolutely enormous. So if you can get your hands on the big four of the White Star Line, the White Star Fleet by Mark Chernside, I would highly recommend because it's just, it's got good weight to it as well. It's just a good, a good read. It's full of pictures. And you know what? I like pictures. Thank you very much, Kat. Reading is fundamental. Yes. Mindless Shark gives us two dollars. Thank you, Mindless Shark. Good to see. You. Don't go biting anybody. Bubbly with two dollars says my cat is orange. Was he born orange or have you spilt something on him? That is the question we're all waiting to find out. Let's find out later on. Thank you very much, my friend. Brady Cloud, I like your name, says, if I had a nickel for every time an Olympic class ship had something to do with the sinking of a submersible, <laughs> I'd have two nickels. I, I laughed at that before I realized actually what you were saying. Um, let me think about that. Yeah, I guess there was that, that U-boat in the First World War. Hmm. Yeah, you got me on that one. You got me to read that one out. Well done. Like the name. Can't believe I just read that out. Tiffany. <laughs> Tiffany says, just binge your live streams, hoping you play more World of Warships. Yes, such a fun game. I love it. People thought I was just shilling for World of Warships, but I've been playing it since 2017. <laughs> yeah, it is a fun game. I don't really get much time to play games anymore, but when I do... It's World of Warships. Thanks very much, Tiffany. Good to see you. Thanks for thanks for joining. Russell says, hello from London. You always do live streams when I'm having my Sunday night bath. Appropriate. <laughs> <laughs> Loved your video on the history of the White Star Line. Um, have you thought about a video on uh, sail liners, sail ships? Yeah. That's a whole other, you know, world that we just haven't touched. There is just so much history and like amazing stories. I was reading another book. Which I can't see around me right now. About the era of uh, migrant 
ships out to Australia and kind of like what the conditions were like. And we've talked about that a lot on the channel and how horrendous it was. But the the absolute audacity of some of these captains, first of all, they were just lunatics. They would just send their ships, you know, they'd, they'd, what they'd do is they'd leave from Britain, go down south to um, South America, and they'd keep going as far south as they could before hanging a hard... Um, their left, a hard left port and going straight out east to Australia, going under Australia to end up in Melbourne, which is where I'm from, right? Which presented a problem because although it was the fastest way, it cut the journey down by a matter of weeks doing that because previously they'd kind of hug, um, you know, they'd, they'd kind of go stay fairly close to coast and then kind of like just go out across the indian ocean which added weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks that was the traditional way of getting to australia they figured if you go you hold off on that eastward turn until you go way 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 down south it's called the great circle route and then swing hard under australia you'd get, um, or, you know go way under the indian ocean and get out to australia that way you'd, you'd get here a lot faster so it cut it right down i think one of the clippers could do it in about gee i forget i think it was 67 days it was maybe Marco Polo set the record, but, and here was the issue. Icebergs would drift up from Antarctica and a ton of ships just disappeared from that era. It was like you were, to get out to Australia, you were really taking your life into your own hands and saying, well, I'm going to risk it to get there. There was one group of sister ships called the Lock uh, sister ships from the Lock line. Lock Ard probably being the most famous. I'm going to do a video about her eventually. There was something like 15 sister ships and only five made it to scrapping because the rest were either sunk in World War I, which, all right, fair, you know, that, that kind of happens in war, but the rest, ground on rocks, disappeared, last seen in the vicinity of ice, last seen entering a storm. It's just an amazing, amazing bit of history. And the, um, the lock art especially is such a fascinating story. So, um, yes, I'm excited to do a video on sailing ships. And I hope you're having a fun time in your Sunday night bath. I like to imagine you've got the screen set up. You've got a model of the HMS Warspite bobbing next to you. <laughs> a model of the Johan van Orden Barnevelt on the other side. Good to see you. Thank you for joining us. Fat Produce says, what are your favorite line of focused YouTube channels? Well, this may surprise you, uh, but I don't watch a lot of YouTube. <laughs> I'm too busy making stuff. Although I do have some favorite channels and we'll go through them presently after I have my, my coffee. Mm. where to begin um there's a couple off the bat i mean probably the some of the best produced you know big old boats bradley over at big old boats those are really beautifully produced videos and it's kind of like ship asmr listening to bradley talk so yeah highly recommend those um sam from historic travel he's a friend of the uh, the channel very passionate um, really deep knowledge about the events surrounding the titanic sinking which sometimes i kind of mix up and you know I, i'm not as uh familiar with the people side of things i'm more you guys know i'm more like rivets and things if it's people eh, you know if it's got rivets on it though that's where i step in and then a, a huge favorite of mine which i've been watching for ages is bright sun films not to be confused with bright side bright sun films jake he's a legend he does really cool videos mostly about abandoned places but he does stories about disasters and ship sinkings there's another youtube channel that i watch called brick immortar brick immortar um which is about the you know failings and engineering failings and disasters and things like that which i highly recommend going and checking out brick immortar's stuff never spoken with him really cool stuff um drac nfl as well a maritime naval historian he's an actual bona fide historian he really knows what he's talking about he was just in melbourne he's from britain he was in melbourne last month and i completely missed it i found out the day he left melbourne that he was actually in melbourne otherwise i would have uh, invited him for a beer he may not have said yes no. um but no highly recommend drac nfl as well so yeah there's a whole whole list and of course the titanic honor and glory um YouTube channel. I don't know if you've seen that. They've got some beautiful, like, beautiful graphics and things like that. Those are some of my favorites. John Day. Enjoyed hearing about how the systems worked on Titanic. Enthused for more of those. Need to find out that they recovered some of Titanic's whistles. Yeah. That just blows my mind. And just that you can, um, there was a video of Spammels, the uh, YouTuber, put up on his channel where he had, I think it was, um, it was footage that was given him by 
<clears throat> one of the um, one of the guys who was there present for that, and also the raising of the big piece and some of that stuff. And they they you could just see them gingerly working up. They used compressed air, not steam. And you just see them gingerly working it up. And the guy like opens it. The last time they blow him, he opens the valve a little too hard, maybe, and shuts it off immediately. And you get maybe the the only time you hear that real throaty like roar from these three whistles is really cool. So yes, very exciting. I agree. But yeah, I, look, there's there's a lot of stuff that made these ships work. There's a lot of systems in place. You know, like I haven't even touched really on like the sewage or the water. You know, there was a lot of there was hot and cold and salt and fresh water running through the ship at the same time. There was all these things that are probably worth videos that people might be interested in that will also again teach you again if you learn how Titanic works, you know how this thing works. You know, you know how the Queen Mary works. You know. That's kind of been my mantra, has been to, you know, lure you in with Titanic stuff. And then guess what? Surprise, now you're an expert on virtually every other ocean liner. You didn't even realize it. Surprise. R uh, Roberto Diaz Costa again says, I remember the Nomadic. Oh, of course, when she was on the, um, on the river there, on the scene, right? I remember the Nomadic. I saw it just in front of the Eiffel Towers when it was a restaurant. Yeah, for those of you who didn't know this, the Nomadic being the, the little tender ship that would ferry first class passengers at Cherbourg in France to, originally it was designed for the Olympic class and then two of those sank. So it was just the Olympic and then all the other White Star and Cunard line ships would use this ship. She would ferry out first class passengers and some baggage to, to the waiting liner because these ships were so big, they couldn't actually moor anywhere along the northern French coast potentially La Havre, I, in, in, I guess. Normandy was designed to operate out of La Havre, but the White Star Line ships called at Cherbourg. Therefore, they needed a big boat, a tender to run people out, pick, you know, drop them out at the ship. Nomadic was that ship. She was purpose, designed and built next to Olympic and Titanic at the same time uh, in 1911 and served for years and years and years and then was finally retired and kind of laid up on the Seine in France and turned into a floating hotel. She had all her like superstructure and upper works ripped off and she was just a floating, um, not a hotel, sorry, a restaurant. And fell into disrepair, which fair enough, she was, you know, over 100 years old, but was rescued at the last minute from the scrapper's yard in the 2000s and sent to Belfast where she was built, where she was fully restored and turned into a museum ship. And I've been on board and it was like one of the happiest days of my life. You can see there's photos of me. I think I've shown them before, but you can see me like, pointing at rivets like so excited to to see actual rivets on a ship yeah that, that's that's cool you're a you're an og nomadic fan because you've seen her not looking her best um i'm i uh, please uh, apologies if i mess up anybody's names here i'm going to do my best here vegar uh vin fallet says uh thanks for all your quality content mike i have a hard time understanding what gross registered tons really means and why it's important would you mind clarifying this is a really interesting topic because one of the questions people often ask me is, how was Titanic bigger than Olympic? You know, was it heavier? And gross registered tons, even though it has tons you know, stuck to the end of it, does not mean weight. It means internal volume. It's actually a measure of, of internal volume of this ship, right? So what actually is a registered ton in this context? Gross registered tons refers to usable interior space of a ship. So you could have a ship five times bigger than, than Titanic, but if you have no enclosed spaces, if somehow hypothetically and theoretically you were able to design a ship which was open at all ends, its gross registered tonnage would be virtually nothing. Titanic and Olympic were the same size. They were identical sizes. I think maybe... Titanic might have been like an inch or two longer, but same size, right? The only way Titanic was actually bigger than Olympic was that they um, enclosed, and people often say they put windows on ADEX promenade, therefore that was an enclosed and it counted as interior space, but it wasn't because it was open at either end. So a promenade deck does not count towards a ocean liner's gross registered tonnage because it is not enclosed. It's not got four walls and a roof. It's got two walls at either end, and then it's open. Titanic's A deck was still an open promenade. Down below, the deck below, B deck, 
Titanic Olympic, sorry, had an open promenade there as well. But on Titanic, at one end, they put the a la carte restaurant on the port side. On the starboard side, they had the Cafe Parisien. So that blocked B deck, the promenade. Then they deleted the promenade altogether and filled it with staterooms. So now that entire, these two strips on either side of Titanic, which would have been promenades once, are now interior space. And then on top of that, they put some additional staterooms up on um, on A deck. Uh, was it A deck, I think? A deck or the boat deck, either one, I forget. Some first class staterooms near the grand staircase. And so enclosing these spaces meant Titanic's gross registered tonnage, her usable internal volume was bigger than that of Olympic. When Olympic was refitted after Titanic sank, those spaces were enclosed as well. She received some additional um, staterooms and spaces. So her gross registered tonnage ended up being even bigger than that of Titanic's. So it wasn't that Olympic was, you know, getting necessarily heavier. She probably was, but her gross registered tonnage, her volume, her internal volume that was actually usable and could be registered was, was therefore bigger than Titanic's. Thank you for attending my TED talk. <laughs> Hope that was uh, interesting and useful for you. Yeah, we, um, I did a little bit of analysis and looked around, you know, exactly how Olympic had, had jump in tonnage, like where that actually came from after her refits and figured that actually by, um, adding the Cafe Parisien and then enclosing one end of B deck that then would have counted as internal volume. Interesting stuff. At least to me anyway. And the 600 of you who are listening. 600. Amazing. Lara's Flying Adventures. Lara, hello. How are you? Here is some money towards a flight to the UK. 20 pounds. Thank you so much, Lara. That's also a lot of coffees. I don't know. I don't know which one it'll go towards first. Mm. I guess I'll go to Bristol. That's where that's where the people want me to go. Have I missed anyone? Oh yeah, there's a couple. There's a couple going on. Let's see what we've got here. Oh, there's actually quite a few. I'm so you know I'm so bad at this. You guys know I'm I'm bad at catching up. All right, let me have a quick look. Let me go back. Let me go back. All right, yeah, there's Lara's. All right, perfect. We've caught up. Thanks, Lara. Um, Howling Wolf, a super chat at a, uh, a pound. Thank you very much. Um, again. The coffee fund is always growing. Um, Angel says, any plans to revamp the Discord to fit more people? We do have a Discord server. It is a place where people go and talk about ships sometimes. Most of the time, they just end up arguing. <laughs> do I plan on uh, revamping the Discord? Maybe. I don't know. I think we're... It's pretty big. There's a lot of... It's already got like 600 people in it. But thank you for your support, Angel. Good to see you. Hope you're doing all right. Um, Patrick has super chatted two dollars. Love what you do. Keep it up, man. Thank you, my friend. Thank you. I have a lot of fun doing it. Uh, Celeste. Hi, Mike. Anecdotes for first class Titanic passengers. Celeste has become a channel member and she's asking for first class Titanic passenger anecdotes. I don't know why I said it like that. Anecdotes. You're putting me on the spot here because you know, I'm a, a rivet guy. You know, I don't really, the people are secondary to me. Um, anecdotes, anecdotes. <laughs> You're putting me on the spot. What was it? There was a, um, there were obviously some really good ones. Like the, um, the story of Archibald Butt, I think is an interesting story. I think for me, the, the reports about Astor. So John Jacob Astor, that whole story is fascinating and a, a bit bizarre. You know, this 48 year old guy, I think it was about 48, marries a, you know, 18 year old essentially or flees with her, you know, once she's pregnant. Causing a massive, massive stir. I mean, in society back in the US, this was like just unbelievable. It would have obviously, you can just imagine the ladies at, at tea. Said, you know, have you heard about Astor? You know, horrified. So just they, they, you know, essentially flee for privacy's sake and end up over in Europe and they go to Egypt and they do this whole thing. And I think they went to Egypt. And then they end up, coming back to the US. So they, they would be, you know, tail between their legs, like a, approaching a media, a media sensation, you know, this media storm. And they're on Titanic and just seeing, seeing it play out, the dramas, the anecdotes about the night where, you know, Astor is in the gymnasium and he's got his pen knife out and he's opening up the life vest to show Madeline, his wife, 
what the you know the flotation panels the cork in there and how it worked and then he asks to to board the uh to board the lifeboat and gets turned away by Lytle or I believe it was and I think he gave Madeline his gloves and just these little things that just really humanize them and you can really just see it in your mind's eye it's yeah that the, the Aster story always made me a little a little sad so I don't know if that was a, a good enough anecdote for you but also, it's it's pretty well known. The Astor story is well well known. Anyway, Michael McLeod, Michael, I like your name. Hi, Mike. What's the next shipwreck? <laughs> Sorry, I'm having a t- hard time reading. Though, what's the next shipwreck that you'd like to get full 3D photo scan treatments that the Titanic just had? There are so many down there. Yeah, photogrammetry is super exciting. I would love. They started doing it a little bit on the wreck of the Cormoran, which was the ship that engaged and sank HMAS Sydney and then was sunk in return. I'd love to see the wreck of Sydney. I'd love to see Bismarck in more detail, the the German battleship. I would love a more detailed analysis of, I think they've started on Lusitania. So there's a company doing Lusitania bit by bit and the um, Empress of Ireland. I would love to see a really, really detailed map of the Empress's wreck just to kind of understand what's happened there because it looks like the superstructure of the ship has just kind of collapsed into the mud and... Now it's really just the hull that's left. But uh, yeah, I'd be really interested to see that wreck. And then also wrecks that have just never been seen since they disappeared. We know where they are, for example. And this is not a joke. Johan van Oldenbarnevelt, right? Obviously becomes the Greek cruise ship Laconia and sinks after burning. To my knowledge, that, that wreck has never been visited again. It's, you know, it's got no like strong intrinsic value as far as... Uh, you know, a historical artifact yet, you know, maybe in 50 years time, it'll be a hundred years old and people will be saying, oh, we have to dive this hundred year old wreck. I mean, it sank in like 1963, you know what I mean? So it'll be, I would love to see that wreck and kind of see where it's at and what's happened to it. Very interesting story. You guys know I'm, I'm attached to the Laconia story. So I want to redo it now. Now we've got better animators and things better animator i was the animator at the time now we could now we have much better animations <laughs> i'd love to redo that story so yeah if i had to pick one wreck honestly actually it would be the wreck of the cruise ship laconia because i'd just love to see kind of like what happened to it and what it looks like now liam has super chatted two dollars and says will you do a video on the ss kiwatin i would love to yeah she is a preserved steamer up in canada i believe i think it's canada and um she's in really nice shape I would love to, love to uh, do a little more on her. I'd love to visit. Maybe I can go there and actually film. Jack G, I think I know this guy. I think I know this bloke. Says, Mike with like five E's. Mike, um, show them some Aquitania clips. No. <laughs> I mean, I haven't. I don't know how to do it. I haven't got it set up. Sorry, Jack. We'll find a do this. We'll find a way to do it. We'll we'll, we'll figure it out. They're going to see the video this weekend. Oh yeah, spoiler alert. The video this weekend is really good. Keep an eye out for it. Uh, Ali S has super chatted two euros and says, who is this Mike Brady and why is he my friend? You had no choice in the matter. We're just friends now. I'm so sorry. (laughs) Surprise. Who is this Mike Brady? Well, some of you may not know this. Some of you may be watching from home and you might have... I wanted to show you this, but I don't have a way of like easily doing it. So I'm just going to tell you with interpretive dance this week just gone the the news about titan the submersible and everything that happened had just this bizarre knock-on effect where every titanic video i ever made skyrocketed and so people who'd never seen the channel before started watching and like you can literally just see it do this the viewership you know so bittersweet it's really lovely to see the channel humming and people enjoying the content I mean, we just passed like two hundred eighty thousand subscribers which is unbelievable it has come at obviously the cost of, you know, this disaster and, uh, you know, a hero to the channel, Paul Henry Nagiole and the whole thing, which is, yeah, still a bit tender. But the um, it's resulted in a lot of people who, who've never maybe seen me before, so I have no idea. So for context, my name is Michael Brady. I'm a um, industrial designer, illustrator, and now producer, presenter of um, ocean liner design. So my background is in really design. It's more like concept design. I'm not an engineer, but and I'm certainly not a historian, but I'm a um, enthusiastic enthusiast 
is how I would describe myself. And I, yeah, I've got a background in kind of like concept design and then I approach the history of ships and things, which has always been a passion. I kind of take what I've been trained to do at uni, what I'm interested in doing, blend it together, put it out on YouTube and hope you guys enjoy it. So that's essentially how it works. I did, uh, I was actually thinking about this the other day. When did I start with the whole, it's your friend, Mike Brady. It took me like 10 videos, I think. I think I got 10 videos in before I was like, I need to find a way to open my videos. And I was wearing a waistcoat and tie. And I thought I already look kind of formal. It should be like a formal greeting. So I was experimenting with things like, so that's the ladies and gentlemen made it into that. That's the formal aspect. And I thought, no, that's a little bit too rigid. It can't just be like, ladies and gentlemen, I'm Mike Brady and this is Ocean Liner Designs. It sounds like I'm announcing myself at a ball. So I thought I'd just soften it with a, ladies and gentlemen, I'm your friend, Mike Brady. And also, obviously, naturally, because we're friends. So sorry, Ali, but I guess we're friends now. Russell has super chatted uh, 20 pounds. It says, excellent waistcoat. Thank you very much. Very second class. Oh, okay. Not first class. But second, <laughs> love your short clips on random tech on the Titanic. We'd love to see a video mm, on the galleys. Yeah, and the food prep aboard liners and the gym and health facilities. Yeah, that's a really cool idea. Yeah, the, the, the food is mind-blowing. Even um, I went on Queen Mary 2 back in March and just on a modern ship with all the technology that we've got, it's still mind-blowing. It's still a production just machine. And Titanic was the same. But of course, everything they did on Titanic, they were doing with coal-fired ovens they had electric ovens i believe but a lot of coal amazing um oh, just making that food that standard of quality of food that much of it that regularly blows my mind so yeah i think a um i think a, a titanic food video would be in the works i'm also getting some new waistcoats made up this is hopefully going to tie in i think i just mentioned that but this is going to hopefully tie in with a future channel announcement that um, I'm going to introduce some ties and waistcoats and a buddy of mine's going to make them. He's a tailor and um, they're going to have, so the ties are going to have nautical themes. So they're going to have, I'm going to see if I can actually get ships printed on them. So ocean liners or flags from house lines and things. And then the inside, the lining of the waistcoats could be like the ocean liner, house flags, my profiles of ships and things like that. So I actually like get some waistcoats made up of different colors and things that, that I will wear that's really the main reason I'm doing it. But then also if you guys are thinking about, you know, cause you can put a waistcoat on with a nice shirt and kind of like really zhuzh an outfit up. So yeah, see if you guys like it. Um, Fat Produce says, what convinced you that J. Bruce Ismay was treated unfairly by history after the Titanic disaster? There's a lot of hearsay about what J. Bruce Ismay was about on Titanic. So he's of course Titanic's owner to some extent so he was the white star line chairman now white star line bearing in mind is owned by international mercantile marine at the time which is of course headed by uh mr jp morgan and so really imm owned titanic uh bruce ismay was essentially titanic's <laughs> curator slash caretaker if you will you know, he's obviously White Star Line flag. She was a White Star ship. So the Ismay family had been involved in building ships with Harlem Wolf for, for decades. It's clear to me that Ismay was extremely proud. Not as like a, I can't imagine, not, not in like a particularly haughty kind of way, but he was just clearly, I just get giddy schoolboy vibes from him. Like the fact that he's got this iceberg warning in his pocket and he's running around showing it to people saying, Look at this, you know, like our ship is so big that we don't have to worry about this. Isn't that exciting? He was clearly a big salesman, very excited about being on his ship. And I can empathize with that. You know, you just can't imagine how exciting that must be. He had taken over from his dad. He had a lot to prove. And then on the night of the sinking, he gets into a boat. He's a civilian. Although he's company chair, you know, the, the judge at the time, I think not judge, but one of the lords at the inquiry said, you know... <laughs> If you had stood by and died, it would have just been one more death to add to the to the story. I mean, Ismay didn't push women and children out of the way. You know, he, he wasn't doing this. He was working all night to try and get people away. And he was like the first to be yelling, saying, lower away. He was getting in the way. He was so annoying about trying to get these boats lowered that one of the officers told him to shut up and get out of the way, you know, because he was just that, you know, passionate about getting these boats off with his passengers in them. So he steps into a boat and people for decades now have been condemning him and saying he should have died. He should have stood by and died. Well, 
you know, all I would say is that I would love to see what any of those people would do on, on that night in his shoes. It's very easy to sit here now very comfortably in 2023 and say he should have stepped away and just died with the ship. But, you know, it's pretty, pretty scary stuff in, in real life. So I'd, I'm not so sure about that. So I think, yeah, that is unfair treatment to say you're a coward for surviving. You should have died that night. You know, come on. Mm. So um, it's an interesting bit of history. Um, is he blameless? Probably not. You know, I don't, I don't think, yeah, I don't think he's, he's totally to, uh, there's a whole video. Sorry, I'm just getting lost in my thoughts here. There's a video that I want to do called who is to blame for the Titanic disaster. I, <laughs> I do lump blame on one person and uh, I'm not going to tell it who it is. I'm not going to tell you. No, no, it's, I, I do still think that uh, Captain Smith has to wear virtually all the blame i don't believe in ismay's uh part in the disaster a lot of people think he was goading captain smith into charging ahead into the night and i i don't know that i buy it i don't know that i buy it anyway good question howling wolf says hello mike from uh P pipkin 06 and brett the great 08 we love the rhyming good to see you guys thanks so much for tuning in thank you for joining Big Al Games says, just recently discovered your channel, love your stuff. Have you ever heard of the old 80s kids show Tugs? Yes, looks like it would have been uh, right up your alley. Yeah, no, Tugs. There's a um, there's one of my mods on Discord. She's like a huge Tugs fan. I think she watches it with her son. And yeah, it's, it's a lot of fun. I do like Tugs. Angel says, um, hi Mike, any plans to reform the Discord server to accommodate extra people and prevent more drama? Uh, yes, look. I'm not honestly going to go into Discord drama because I'm not entirely certain that the 650 people watching right now are that interested in Discord drama. I'm certainly not interested in Discord drama. Am I going to be doing things to stop it in future? Yes, I am. Because I just don't care about it and I don't want any more of it. <laughs> but thank you for the $10, Angel. You know, it all helps. You know where it goes. It goes towards our animation team to make cool new ships. Ragdoll Ralph says, ever... Uh, drawn or felt like drawing a tall ship. No, yeah, these are those beautiful old sailing ships. I really, really want to do it. I've got a hell of a book here. Where is it? I can't see it. There's a book called The Law of Ships that goes into like every sail, every every like little detail of how these beautiful old sailing ships were built and designed and what they did. So that would be my Bible if I ever did it. But yeah, unfortunately, I don't really get a huge amount of a uh, huge amount of time to draw anymore. But maybe in future. Um, hi, from Mushka from Belgium. Hello, love your content. If you could go back in time for a few days, what vessel would you want to be on and why? Ooh, that's a good question. Let me think about that. Hmm. I'm going to say Aquitania. I think we've recently, as a team, we've recently fallen in love with uh, Aquitania. The video this weekend, I think I mentioned it the other day, but it's going to be a sequel to the Ocean Liner tech video that we did, how, how um, Ocean Liners evolved from the 1800s all the way through. We did that a month ago or a month and a bit and we're doing the sequel to it. And this one's all about the four stackers. So it's got Lusitania and Mauritania. It's got the German ones, the Crown Princess and Cecilia. It's got the Olympic and Titanic and Britannic, courtesy of our friends at Titanic Honor and Glory. And it's, it ends on Aquitania. And um, what a gorgeous, gorgeous ship she was. The interiors are spectacular. So yeah, I would say I'd love to spend a day just kicking around Aquitania, I think. She was called the ship beautiful for a good reason. Good question. Ragdoll Ralph says, have you read Master and Commander, the Aubrey Maturan series? I have. They're my favorites. Master and Commander. The movie is my favorite movie. My favorite historical film probably ever made. I don't know. Can we get some like love in the chat for Master and Commander? I think it's probably the, the best history drama made. Just the commitment was so good. An Australian director, no less, Peter Weir. Um, yeah, no, no, absolutely love them. Hornblower as well. Um, and that series was great. They're all good, good things. So yeah, completely agree. Good question. Fat Produce. If you ever get to Kansas City, you should uh, go to the Steamboat Arabia Museum. It's an absolutely spectacular shipwreck museum for us land lovers. Yeah, the Arabia. Now, just to get this right, there were... There was a steamship that sank 
during the American Civil War. I'm tr- there, there was, I'm trying to think of which one this was. There was one called, I think it was called the Sultana. And I'm wondering if the Arabia, I don't know if I'm getting them confused or if I'm completely off the mark. But as I understand it, Arabia sank, she was this big old steam riverboat and around about the time of the Civil War, is that right? And her wreck was like perfectly preserved in the mud. And they pulled up like all these amazing artifacts. Is that at this museum? Because as I remember, there were like, you know, bits of cutlery and bottles of, of like uh, laudanum and all this stuff that they were pulling up that was like perfectly, perfectly preserved. Um, yes, would love to go and see that. Becky Boo. Uh, <laughs> Becky Boo, cute name. Hiya, uh, thank you for making these videos. Just received um, off a friend a piece of the 1994 uh, Recovery Expedition Titanic coal pieces. Very nice. Do you own anything similar um, from Titanic or other ships? Love you. I've got over there. That's it. That is a fruit bowl from the Empress of Ireland. That is a... I'll go through my collection one day with you guys. I'm just trying to... Yeah, that is a signed theatre sheet by two of the victims of the Empress of Ireland um, who were passengers on board. Very sad story. I've got a few bits and pieces on that side of that. Up there. I don't know if you can see... Yeah, that. That thing. That's a lifeboat plaque from the ship that carried my family to Australia. That's from the Strathnava. So I've got like a lot of little hidden things here and there. But yeah, a lot of nice bits and pieces. Do not have Titanic coal, however. So... It's always been my joke is like, uh, how do you make a Titanic nerd happy at Christmas time? You give them coal. <laughs> Titanic fans are the only people intentionally trying to be naughty. So sad it drops off uh, coal. Uh, James, any reason why some of the Titanic videos were privated? I'm guessing it's because of Titan, uh, but just was curious. No. So the other reason why this week has been a big week is because um, Ocean Ladder Designs is engaged in a copyright dispute. So unfortunately, the channel was copyright struck by a creator and um, photographer whose content we inadvertently used. And unfortunately, yeah, I have tried to explain the channel's position and apologize, but they're not entirely happy with that. And yeah, it's it's resulted in... Um, yeah, a few things being taken down. I've taken down some content. A lot of videos on Titanic I've had to pull because, you know, it's a bit sad. You know, I started out doing this just for fun. I didn't really know what I was doing. And, you know, you just kind of start out by kind of hoping things that you use fall under fair use. And then you kind of get a little bit more copyright maturity and realize that, no, you can't, you know, you can't just take people's things. So yeah, I think the channel's gone through a bit of copyright maturity. It's also why I didn't get a video out this weekend because now there's actually quite a um, complicated legal screening process of every video that I do, you know, and yes, it is a bit sad. Um, unfortunately, those videos won't be coming back. I will probably recut them and release them again into the future and redo them totally. But it, uh, it did hurt a little bit because the, you know, it was like at the same time that the Titan submersible drama was playing out and then people were really interested in what we were doing and then we had to pull all these videos down. So there was just no, a lot of momentum for the channel died off. And um, so that was, yeah, again, like I, it felt grubby anyway because it was off the back of like this human disaster and tragedy. So anyway, yeah, no, that the, the channel is currently engaged in a copyright situation. So I have privated, I think about 15 videos at least. So taking steps to sort it out and make sure that the channel doesn't get deleted essentially. <laughs> so there you go. Um, Amos says, hi, Mike, love your videos. How do you feel about recovering Titanic's Marconi wireless system? Look, Robert Ballard would hate me for this. I'm kind of, you know, I don't, as soon as the Titan thing happened, people were saying, oh, you know, if it hits the wreck, I'll be so pissed off and I'll be so mad because it'll break the wreck and damage it and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, to my mind, I'm not as big on you know, perfectly preserving the wreck as it is. I think there's, you know, a lot to be said for sensible recovery of certain things so that, you know, the, the history can be taught and it can be, you know, seen and touched. What I'm not crazy about is every single thing recovered from the Titanic ending up in, uh, in the United States. You go to Belfast, the actual Titanic Museum, where the ship was built, and there wasn't a single recovered wreck artifact there. How how a piece of the big piece couldn't be there is beyond me. You know, it was I was really disappointed. I, I thought I was expecting like this big, you know, extravaganza. I haven't seen any Titanic wreck stuff really. 
And unfortunately, yeah, it's really like the big piece is in Vegas, you know? So I'm not crazy about that. Obviously it's, that's a big for-profit thing. Um, but yeah, I think for example, the wireless system, if that were to be recovered and then, uh, I like the idea of recovering these things and then preserving them beautifully and having them for, for view, but then profits and proceeds being put back into study or research or rec conservation or, or, you know, ocean conservation, that kind of thing. So I think it can be kind of like a give and take, you know? So yeah, anyway, I'm, I'm down. If they, if they could look, if they get in there without do minimal damage to the ship, pull out some of the Marconi system, I don't, I don't really don't see a problem with it. It's going to be a, it's going to be a, a rust colored stain on the ocean floor within 50 years, probably. So, you know, go to it. It's not going anywhere. Oh, sorry. It's, I mean, it's going away essentially. It's, it's just sitting there. It's going to, it's going to go. So thank you. Good question. We've we got here. We've got Max Mello. Um, gee, I can't believe I've been talking for almost an hour straight. I had all these plans to, to do things with you guys. I got to hurry up. Thanks for all your beautiful super chats. I know we haven't caught up for a long time, us, us lot. So, um, yeah, I appreciate your, obviously you've got a lot of questions, so I'm going to keep working through them and then we'll reveal the winner of the Ocean Liner Design's first design contest. Max Mello says, hi, Mike. Great channel. Thank you, Max. Question. Do you think a replica of Titanic would work well in today's age with modern adjustments? Either way, explain why. I don't think it would work well because people would be really kind of probably disappointed. Hmm. Thanks to movies and media, we've got this idea of what Titanic was. You know, we picture it as like the most sumptuous, luxurious palace afloat. And for Edwardian taste, it was pretty nice. But we've, you know, it's 110 years on, you know, th this ship now would be, it would seem so kind of small. And you got to remember as well that we just think of first class when we think of the luxury. First class was was a very small part, relative part of the ship. Second class was comfy, but again, you know, you can experience Titanic second class. Look up historic hotels in your city. See if there's anything from the 1900s and go there for the day and sit in the lobby. And guess what? That's the equivalent of sitting in Titanic's smoking room or reading and writing room. We've got a hotel here in Melbourne called the Windsor Hotel. Um, it, the interior is perfectly Edwardian, although it is a Victorian hotel that, you know, the inside is like very Edwardian and that's kind of like a simulator because it's no mistake. Titanic was designed in first class and second class to emulate some of the great hotels of the world. Just make it feel like you're in a hotel. You got to remember a huge portion of the ship's complement were in third class. People would be disappointed. I think by, if you were to perfectly recreate Titanic, paying for a first class ticket and seeing exposed piping on your ceiling. That was pretty standard. Um, exposed steel bulkheads in first class. Seeing, you know, not all of the staterooms were this lush, luxurious, you know, they were pretty basic. I, I think people would be shocked. Also, a 45,000 ton ship in 1912 was enormous. 45,000 ton ship now, not so big. <laughs> no balconies. You know, people are conditioned and used to immediate entertainment and doing all these things. Here's the list of activities that you can do with aboard Titanic. Promenade, so you can walk around. Reading. Eating. Smoking. Writing. Drawing. Hopscotch. Um, deck quoits. Shuffleboard. Chess, probably a game of chess. Three-legged races, I know they did those. I think that's about it. Talking, <laughs> you know, there's not this like, there's, there's ships now with go-karts, you know, like it's just absurd. So no, I don't think, I think people would be disappointed. They'd, they'd get on board, they could be all excited and they'd go through day one and day two and really like live out their Titanic fantasies and then realize there's like four days left of the voyage. So they'd be kind of sitting there rocking backwards and forwards being like, I need my computer. <laughs> so no, I don't think it would, I don't think it would work very well, unfortunately. If you filled it with like modern technology and stuff, sure. But then what was the point of building a Titanic in the first place? You know what I mean? I think there would be enough like purist Titanic nerds to um, like, would you honestly tell me in the chat, would you personally sail on a 100% authentic Titanic replica that wasn't going to sink? Although I'm sure some of you would sail on it if you knew it was going to sink anyway for like the RPG element of it, role-playing. But 
Yeah, would you would you sail on a perfectly authentic ship with no modern technology in it, with just reading and writing? To me, it sounds like heaven because I'm just glued to my computer and I desperately want to just sit back and read something. Yeah. Anyway, let me know. Would you do it? Six days? Imagine six days without your phone. Think about that. I know we all, we all rush to say, oh, yeah, I can do that. But are you going to get three days in and be like sitting there with your eye twitching <laughs> like an addict? <laughs> mm. um, Grem Paltaken has super chat at $5 and said, did you get my email about the Spirit of London? AKA the Ocean Dream, the ship they filmed Columbo on. No, I didn't. Although I, I think, did you just send it through? Yes, you just resend it. Thank you. I will have a look at that. That's very good. Excellent. This is funny. I, I was expecting more questions about the Titan submersible, but I feel like everybody's questions have kind of already been answered by, by recent news. Notification. Now, Super Chat of $5 and said, if you could change any one thing about Cameron's 1997 Titanic, what would it be? <sighs> That's a good question. Gee, no one's asked about that. If you could change one thing. I... Don't know, actually. Um, gee, you really caught me off guard with that. What, what would you guys do? What would you change? I know a lot of you will say, well, we'd delete Jack and Rose. But, I, you know, that that kind of, like, is what drove the story. They got rid of a lot of, like, cool historical moments that hit the cutting room floor. And they're now all deleted scenes. I love to see those put back in. You know, I think there was, like, a lot of Jack and Rose and then, yeah, they had these little bits with Ida and Isidore Strauss saying farewell and like explaining how they ended up in their, you know, in their bed right at the end, cuddling each other. And just some actual historical moments that were taken out. I want to see those put back in. I know big Titanic nerds like me have spent ages watching the deleted scenes from Titanic. They were good. Crazy Doctor Who. Hello, says. Hi there, Mike. Great to see you again. Good to see you too. You're the best friend that anyone could have. Really? Oh, thank you. Also, uh, you said your voyage in Queen Mary 2 was in March. We're in July. Holy ship. How time flies. That's my favorite ship pun. I know. Time does fly. Yeah. Mum and I, I, I know, you guys, I don't know if I told you, I took my mum on the Queen Mary 2. We sit back and we reminisce like it was old days. <laughs> we'll have like a, a bottle of champagne and we just talk about, oh, do you remember when we went to the restaurant? Remember when we did this? Remember when we did this? It was really, really nice. Yeah. We had a, we had a great time. Time does fly. Gee. Essol has said, hi, Mike, any thoughts on Dutch liners? Oh, yeah, New Amsterdam, Rotterdam, and um, Stattendam. Gorgeous, yeah. It's, uh, unfortunately, uh, obviously, the focus of the channel has been a little more Brit-centric, purely because the bigger and, you know, most famous ocean liners were. But, yeah, the Dutch made some pretty, pretty good ships, pretty beautiful ships, and that is probably a topic I intend on covering in future. Um, I do have my schedule built out until about mid-next year, although... With recent events around copyright, I think I'll be changing some of the topics that I do and changing some of the things I actually cover. So um, I think I will. I think I will change some of the topics and introduce maybe some some things about the Dutch ships. Right. Noel Elizabeth says, what's a ship you wish was as popular as Titanic? Oh, you know, all of them. I mean, I'm, I'm grateful to the Titanic story in that it's a gateway drug. For ships, you know, I, I was just a little obsessed Titanic nerd when I was like four years old. Now I'm just about as obsessed as like with with the Orient lighters there as I am with Titanic. And, you know, people barely know anything about those, you know, Tranto and Orsova and all those. So, yeah, love them. Oops, sorry, I just hit my microphone. If that was loud, apologies. Ali says, hi, Mike. I uh, asked a while back uh, what those uh, hanging ring things, the Titanic firemen... Pulled. Oh, yeah. You said you would find out. Did you find out? No, I didn't. <laughs> so, sorry. No, I forgot to ask. Yeah. I can't tell if it was a way to shut off or open the... the Because the, they shut the damper in the firebox and then they they pull those things. I mean, I, I assume it's something to do... I mean, oh, I'm just conjecturing at this point. I'm, I'm not even going to answer it because I just don't know. Sorry, Ali. I'll, I'll ask. I promise. I won't forget. Uh, James says, RMS Aquitania is my favorite for a reason. Beauty. Agreed, my friend. 
Um, B. Dalton says, I'm a merchant marine sailor, Titanic influenced me to go to sea. Thanks for the videos, brother. That's very cool. Yeah, yeah, hey, look, see, like I said, Titanic's the gateway drug. Just You just committed to the ocean thing. That's very impressive. Sussex Rail Enthusiast says, Hi, Mike, I went on Shield Hall yesterday. Oh, managed to do some filming in the engine room. Wondered if you'd find some B-roll footage uh, useful. Please send it to me at linerdesigns1 at gmail.com. Would love to see it. Thank you. We've got, uh, is Andrew Irving? Did Andrew Irving just leave a comment? Andrew Irving is my, is my editor. Hello, Andrew. What are you doing watching YouTube at this hour? <laughs> Get back to work. If you're watching this, Andrew, I'm telling on you. Just kidding. Uh, Spirit of Railway says, Hi, Mike. I just recently found out one of my relatives immigrated to Canada on the Aquitania in 1946. It's surely one of the best ships ever created. That ship was in service from 1914 until the 1950s. It was just ridiculous. Very cool story. That's awesome you've got that personal connection. Well done. Daniel says, is it just me or um, do a candid behind the scenes photos of the actors hanging out on Titanic set bring the ship to life almost better than the movie? Yeah, seeing people hanging out. I forget who it was. I think it was Ken Marshall who was talking about when he was actually on set and seeing people dressed up. These are actors in costume, right? But you automatically would have, and he said they were doing this, people would, 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 um, pay more respect to first class passengers in their costume. You know, if they're in like white tie and the women in those beautiful dresses with the big hats, you'd step out of their way and open the door for them and just automatically treat them with more respect. And then, then the people dressed as third class. I mean, it sounds horrible, but he said that on set, the extras, you know, they, there was actually, and then the first class extras would just hang out with each other. And the second and third class extras apparently would just hang out with each other. So it was immediate class subdivision. It's just fascinating. From a um, society standpoint, I find that really interesting. But yeah, no, I totally agree with you. Howling Wolf with another uh, another pound. Thank you, my friend. Really appreciate it. Always for the coffee fund. You guys know this channel is fueled on coffee. Dimitri says, hello, Mike. Thank you for your amazing content. I've read some information regarding poor quality of steel used on Titanic and how it may have contributed to a sinking. What are your thoughts on that? No, I don't, I don't think that's a fair assessment, unfortunately. There's been a lot made about the steel used in Titanic's construction, but um, for the time, I think, you know, there was, there was a... I, I don't buy too much into that. Again, these articles tend to sway between, oh, no, it was the, the iron rivets that were poor quality, or, oh, no, it was the steel that was poor quality. At the end of the day, it actually didn't matter. I think you have a ship. For, for comparison, by the way, Titanic's sister, Olympic, which was made out of exactly the same stuff, served for something like 20 or 30 years with very, very little cracking. Um, by contrast, other liners of the time, like Imperator, had some pretty significant hull shell cracking. Olympic had a little bit after a storm, but not nearly as significantly as other ships of the time. So her design was very, very good. She rode the ocean very well. The steel, you know, I mean, she served all that time. She bumped into at least three or four ships and came out the better, you know, in those collisions. No, I think you just had a 45, 50,000 ton ship hitting an iceberg that essentially weighs, it displaces millions of, of tons. If that was just enough pressure, any, any modern ship. I mean, it was really essentially the same as Costa Concordia. Very, very similar you know, hitting that rock and, and her side was gouged. It would be the equivalent of sitting back and saying, well, was Costa Concordia steel not high enough quality? It just wasn't designed for that. You know, it couldn't possibly be designed to withstand that. So no, I don't think the quality of steel had a, um, had, it, had it much to do with it. But I can see, you know, there's a lot of articles and things online trying to sell that idea. So you, obviously, you know, you're going to pick that up. So I don't, certainly don't blame you for thinking about it. Um, but I don't think it had anything to do with it at all. Angel says, uh, oh, sorry, I missed one. Um, did I? No. Angel says, should we attack or spam that Titanic creator for copyright striking you? We must have our Titanic videos back. You will have your Titanic videos back. I'm going to recut them. Um, it wasn't a Titanic creator. It was a, yeah. I, w w no attacking or spamming necessary. <laughs> it's okay, guys. We're, we're, the, we're professionals here. You know what Ocean Liner Designs is about. It's all about respectful coolness we don't get into the drama we just make cool videos and and do cool things lino says uh hi 
When in the Netherlands, visit the SS Rotterdam. Yeah, sleep there, take all the tours you can. So almost everything. Um, you can see almost everything. Uh, happy to accommodate you then. Oh, that's lovely. Thank you very much. Yeah, you know, um, Stephen Payne, who's a, another hero of the channel and a naval architect, he designed uh, the Queen Mary 2 with his team. Um, yeah, he's, he knows virtually everything about Rotterdam. It's really interesting. He wrote some papers about it and sent them through, and it's so cool seeing what he what he says about it. And so I, what I would want to do is take Stephen's papers and use that as my guide to walk around the Rotterdam. <laughs> Thank you. Good point. Okay, we're at the hour mark. Um, there's still, geez, 670 of you guys listening. Thanks for tuning in. Good to see you all. I really, honestly, really appreciate it. We, back in the day when I was doing streams, there was like, like a hundred people would tune in. It was, it felt like I was talking to it, like an army of people. And now I've got 670. The Ocean Liner Designs army is, is growing every day. It's awesome. It's good to have you guys here. Thanks. Thank you for joining again. I enjoy these because I get to kind of just sit back and talk with you guys and my family and friends appreciate it because then I get all the ship and Titanic talk out of my system. So when I catch up with them, I talk to them about normal things, like a normal person. So you're actually doing them a service. Um, Duska says, have you ever played uh, the Nintendo Wii Titanic mystery game? No, I haven't. Nope, didn't know that was a thing. That's good. Titanic mystery games are great. I, I know a lot of us played Titanic Adventure out of time. That was the granddaddy of them all. Love your channel, man. Every video is interesting and awesome. You're interesting and awesome, Duska. We appreciate it. Thank you very much. Alex W says, hi, I'm new. Welcome aboard. I didn't have any particular interest in maritime history or ocean liners, but your videos and vibes are so excellent that I'm totally sucked into this channel. Have some coffee. Oh, thank you, Alex. Cheers. Very, very, appreciate very much. $10 will go a long way towards the coffee fund, my friend. Mm. Oh, I can't wait for you guys to see this video this weekend. That video, the first one that we did, the, um, the ocean liner evolution, the ocean liner technology video from last month is my favorite video ever because it's upbeat because it's happy, because it's about like, you know, bringing these ships back to life and it barely, you know, we didn't even talk about tragedy. So I want these videos to be all about how it's really my love letter and the team's love letter to these ocean liners and saying like how beautiful these machines were, you know? So, and, and hopefully someone could watch these videos. Somebody says, oh, I don't get what you're interested in ships for, you know, like pff, they're just ships. I'd love one of those people to watch this video and then walk away and say, oh, okay, well, I kind of get it. I mean, it's still stupid, but I kind of get it. You know, like I would, I would love that because ships, unlike other things, they're not, they're somewhere between a, a machine and a place. And, and they, 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 you know, they have all this romance attached to them because things happen inside ships because they're, they're places, you know, they're massive rooms and areas. So it's like a giant hotel, but it's also a machine. You're in the middle of the ocean. It's like as close to being in space as you can get. So it's, I think it's just interesting. Anyway, so I'm getting philosoph philosophical now. Um, Jake O'Reilly says, it wasn't Titanic's fault. It sank speed kills. Yes. I agree. I agree with you on that. It wasn't Titanic's fault. It sank. There's so much rubbish made about the way Titanic was built, but I'm telling you, Titanic should not have been there at that time. It should not have been sailing into an ice field at full speed. It's as simple as that. Big Al Game says, what do you think the Titan banging sound was? Yeah. I don't know. I think the um, the reports of intermittent banging every half hour was actually just bad reporting. I think it was just misreported. I just don't think it was, uh, just don't think it was happening. I think maybe there was a, it could have been a corruption of the, you know, the US Navy says something around detecting on their sonar, their passive sonar, the sound of an implosion if the word bang was used and it got leaked and like the press picked it up and they might've said, oh, there was a banging noise coming from the wreck. But because of all the, the news that was flying around and misinformation, I, yeah, I, I was genuinely hoping that they were, yeah, they were, they were down there anyway. Ugh. Yeah, I'm not sure. What do I think it was? If it was banging, it could have been yeah, pieces of the shell hitting each other in a current. I think there's like two not currents down there at least. So that could be making some noise, but I think it was honestly just a noise that happened once. And then maybe it was a misreport. Pretty bad. B Dalton, super chat at five bucks and says, uh, what do you think of uh, James Horner, the Titanic soundtrack? It's got that 1912 sound. Yeah. Sadly, we lost him a few years ago. Yeah. It was a, it was a plane crash. Wasn't it? Didn't uh, James Horner, who was lost in a plane crash. It's quite sad. 
yeah, sad to see him go. The um, soundtrack, yeah, there's that one, um, the, 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 the track called Take Her to See Mr. Murdoch, I think is the one that really gets me fired up. Like you just picking up momentum, picking up speed, you know, it's such a great track. I love that. Yeah. I, yeah. Hey, listen, I listen to it for fun. I used to listen to it like, um, yeah, Take Her to See Mr. Murdoch. I'd listen to it while I went for a jog because it's just, you know, it gets you fired up. You want to go out and do something. It's great. Max Mello says, how is Queen Mary 2? Is it worth cruising? Yeah. Oh man. Oh, guys, like it was so much fun. And this wasn't even a transatlantic voyage. I feel like doing the transatlantic thing, you'd get like the real vibes. You get really interesting people and the, you know, the, it would be a little more fancy. This was around uh, the South of Australia. So it was a lot more mellow and laid back, but we had a hell of a time. We had, we made this little cruise family and we were like ballroom dancing. And like there was a, uh, you know, dance orchestra playing basically every night and high tea every afternoon at 3 p.m. It is really like kind of stepping into a different era. And there was this moment when mum and I were in the chart room, this cocktail bar, sitting back, the ocean's going past. They have a string quartet playing the music of Scott Joplin, which I love, like, you know, early 1900s ragtime music that would have been played on the likes of Olympic and Aquitania and Titanic. And it was like this weird, like, transporting moment that was just you know exactly the kind of music the orchestra plays in the movie you know that kind of cheery stuff playing waltzes and things it really like took me back we're all dressed up as well i was in a tuxedo and mum was beautifully dressed and it was 1920s night you know so yeah would would recommend it, it was really fun highlander says highlander 723 i express my compliments on your video about the recent uh, submersible disaster thank you it was the most unbiased, clear-headed, and spectacular piece of journalism on the disaster that I had seen. Compliments. Thank you. That is a that was a glowing review. Yeah. Um, a lot of people accuse me of uh, shilling for OceanGate, the company that was, res- you know, responsible for the submersible. But um, if you actually watch the video and what I said, I wasn't. I was really just highlighting that uh, OceanGate Expeditions, which is the I think the subsidiary that runs dives down to Titanic is one part of OceanGate and then the rest do a lot of research and work in, in all different parts of the world. And um, you go on there, well, I think their website's down now. You could go on it and see, they, they did a ton of research. So when I said that they are a legitimate scientific organization, people said, oh, you're defending OceanGate. But I'm just trying to set the record straight and say, no, like this, the company exists to do science, right? That's literally their mission statement. They've got a track record of doing science. And then titanic dives was one way of funding this and it wasn't even like you can buy a ticket to visit titanic i think it was potentially marketed that way but it was more like if you want to financially back ocean gates expeditions we'll also give the the opportunity to come if you want you know or you could donate your money and come and help us in other ways it was you know so anyway i didn't yeah i wasn't trying to like come in and say the 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 information coming out about how the actual logic and thought process going into the submersible design and construction and ocean gates leadership is very interesting and something I'm following very closely as I'm sure many of us are. Um, Jacob says top five best Titanic documentaries to watch. I think, um, Oh, we've got 666 viewers. Creepy. Just kidding. Good to see you all. Um, Jacob says, yes, uh, five best Titanic documentaries. Ghost of the Abyss, number one, by far the best. I think Titanic, the final word is a close second. That's also very interesting. Um, Saving the Titanic, I think it was called, about Titanic's engineers. That was a really good one. There was a fourth one about how they built the ship. I forget what it's called, but they actually recreated a lot of the scenes of Belfast and building it. And it was it was a really good documentary. That was fascinating. Mm. And then um, the fifth one, Gee, I think I only know four Titanic documentaries. Um, what's a fifth Titanic, a good Titanic documentary? There's just so much rubbish, you know what I mean? I'm just trying to think of... Yeah, we've got James Cameron's ones up there, gee. I don't know. Hey, um, anyone else in chat want to come in and help me out here? Give me a fifth Titanic documentary that isn't the one about building the Titanic, saving the Titanic, the two James Cameron documentaries... So many of them go into like, you know, the build quality of the steel. Uh, Tania says, can you do weekly live streams? Here's to the coffee fund. We'll, 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 we'll do two weekly. I don't want to like bore you guys too much. You know what I mean? We'll do Titanic Birth of a Legend. Thank you, Scott. 
nailed it. Titanic Birth of a Legend. That's the one. And then I think the one about saving the ship, Kaivara got it. I think it's called Blood and Steel. Good work, guys. Love your work. Um, thank you for the, the contribution to the coffee fund, Tanya. Very much appreciated. It's very important. I am a flat white man. I like uh, just a little, a, little, uh, a little milk in there, but I do like my coffee. I've, I've spent a ton on this coffee machine because it's so important to me. <laughs> and the coffee is very expensive in Melbourne. Like six bucks for a coffee now. It's ridiculous. Um, we'll do we'll do two weekly though. I don't want you guys to get sick of my of my mug. Rybold says, "Hey, it's my friend Mike Brady. Are we the Ocean Liner Designs Army or the Ocean Liner Designs Fleet? Yes, you're all members of my of of, of the Ocean not my but the Ocean Liner Designs crew. <laughs> Good to see you." Angel says. Um, it's ironic that Premier Line only bought Rotterdam from um, HAL because p refused to sell Canberra to them. Oh, yeah, had Premier bought Canberra, RIP Rotterdam. That's an interesting bit of history, you know, like just little dis- business. It's all business decisions as well. Very little of this stuff is emotional. You know, companies to see these things as like cash cows because that's what they are and then they just, there. Eh, that one's off to the scrappers. Especially British companies, they had no sympathy or like, desire to save any of these ships you know i know britain was austere post-world war ii but goodness some of the some of the ships that they scrapped so i know this is like a huge departure and a tangent classic mike you're going on a tangent no say it ain't so but yeah scrapping some of those ships the war spite oh, how could they scrap war spite aquitania how could they scrap aquitania <laughs> just makes me sad anyway yes yeah, that, that's a weird alternate history. You imagine uh, Canberra going on for years instead of Rotterdam. It's fascinating. Good point. Fat Prodigy says, what are your thoughts on the liners of the golden era music released from Part-Time Explorer? Yeah, that was cool. So um, HFX Studios, so Tom and um, uh, Kent and all those guys. Uh, Kent Layton, here's a little bit of interesting trivia for you. Kent Layton is a Titanic historian. He's written a ton of books. Lovely guy. And uh, he's also a, um, he's kind of like helps out in a family business, which produces and and repairs classic pianos. And um, I think he's got a a player piano in the store. And so they were running sheet reels through it, like sheet music that was essentially like, uh, you know, like player piano reels. And um, some of these beautiful old pieces, I think the Empress of Ireland Waltz was in there, the Lusitania March, I think it was a March, but yeah, interesting stuff. And um yeah, the music is so intrinsic to that the story of those ships. I'm I'm a big music guy. My dad is a musician professionally. I lo- I love golden age music. I love ragtime and waltzes and things. So similarly, uh, that was a really great production. Um, at the moment, I'm talking with um an, an orchestra over in the uh, the US about um producing music for the channel and kind of collaborating with them f- music from the same era. So that's really exciting, and I'll keep you guys clued in on that. So there you go. Very exciting. Um, have I, did I miss somebody? No, surely not. Oh, I missed quite a few. Yeah, sorry. That was a good question. Thank you, Fat Produce. Um, HU5K3Y2010, which is a real mouthful. Hello, has super chatted $5 and says you get to build design a new liner using different elements from all the, sh- all the ships of history. All the ships, not even ocean liners, just all the ships. What are you building? Uh, a, um, steam, <laughs> a steam collier caravel galleon man of war clipper ocean liner. All the ships of history. Just... Um, what am I building? Uh, that is such an interesting question. we take, yeah. I... <laughs> you guys are asking questions today that are just really putting me on the spot. I promise you in 10 minutes, in 10 minutes, I'm going to uh, move on and show you guys the winner of the design contest. Cause there are like so many of you have been sitting there patiently like, yes, come on, get on with it. Did I win? Um, new liner from all the ships of history. We're going to take Aquitania's interiors, the Olympic classes, exterior flows. So we're going to like take that beautiful, beautiful balance of the Olympic, the Aquitania's interiors. We're going to size Olympic up. We're going to give her, I do like a full funnel ship. No, we're going to give her two or three funnels instead. We're going to like tone down the amount of funnels. She's going to look like a beautiful, elegant yacht, but on the inside, she's going to be big, luxurious, like Aquitania. But that, that, that era of ocean liner, I think for me is like, there you go. Hope that answers it. 
Um, Jay says, thanks for the videos. Oh, sorry, I missed somebody. Um, Sin Eyes, super chat at $10. Thank you very much, my friend. Jay, JJ the third says, thanks for the videos. My father really appreciated, oh, cool, the non-sensationalized information you brought about the sub. Uh, we've been tormenting folks with our new ocean line of nerd knowledge. <laughs> Yes, good. Spawning more ocean liner nerds. Excellent. Um, yes, we're not a sensational channel. I mean, the the content is sensational, but yeah, we're, we're not about sensationalizing. I think it's more, you know, that that uh, disaster needed some some you know like toning down and just getting the facts out. So that's why all I did was talk about how it was built, um, like the reason for it existing. Literally, the design of the submersible was guided by the fact that they needed to get more people down because that was their business model, you know? So it wasn't they just said, oh, we'll make a bigger submersible for the hell of it. It was actually because of their business model. It's very interesting. Directly linked to the fact that in order to fund that element of the business, Ocean Gate Expeditions, they needed to fit three, well, two. They said uh, originally it was meant to be two paying passengers, if you will, but then they added a third one for, you know, well, what the hell? So now I can take five. And then also the technology used to find it. That video of the guy um, diving, Jim Brown, I think his name is, the diver, um, had this footage of like the sonar ping underwater and you just hear it going off into the distance. Just fascinating. So yeah, interesting technology. So it was a, it was a cool uh, bit of history to, to, to tell. Historic Travels is here. Sam Pence, what are you doing here? Hello, mate. He says, I didn't, in full caps, he's like, I didn't know you were live. We need to do a bright side reaction video soon. Who in the chat is with me? Yeah, I'm sure a lot of you guys would have responded to that. Sorry, I'm four minutes behind. I'm catching up though. Good to see you, Sam. We'll do, we'll do it. I'll just be like, I got to tone it down. If people see me reacting over the top, they'll think I'm a, a lunatic, you know, right? <laughs> we'll, we'll do like good, good cop, bad cop, you know? I'll be like the, you know, in every comedy routine, there's like the wacky one and then there's the straight man, you know, the one who just kind of like plays it straight. If you want to run wild with it, I'll be the straight man. <laughs> Howling Wolf says, what's your opinion on the RMS Olympic scrapping? I think my face says it all. Not great. Not great, Britain. Not great. How could you scrap these things? Come on. Not thrilled, I will say. John Navarre says, I'm in the most recent build. I have honor and glory at the moment. I can't find those rings around the boilers. I'm thinking they're a cinematic addition. I may also just be blind. Yeah, they were hanging from the from the um, the. I assume. I mean, I thought it was maybe from the um, from the boiler's firebox or something, but I guess no, because it was quite a ways out, so it could only have been. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'll go look. I will actually do some research on this because it could be a short. You know, it could be an idea for a short. Thanks for the twenty bucks, John. Good to see you. Angel says, "Hi, Mike. Are you in the Titanic Tech Facebook group? If not, please join it. It has plans." And never before seen pics. I can send you the link on Discord. Do that. I'll have a look. Yes. I don't get on Facebook very much anymore. But I'm willing to have a look. So send it through. We caught up on all the super chats. I did it. It only took me an hour and a half. Oh, thank you guys. No, again, like, the super chats are really lovely. And I appreciate every little bit. Because it all, yeah, it all helps the channel. So let's talk real quick about what's going on with the channel and then we'll um, then we'll run through these contest entries and, and I'll tell you who won. So since we last talked, uh, we produced the Empress of Ireland video and documentary, which was a big one and we're all super proud of it. The real time sinking has gone up like to 500,000 views, which is crazy. That was all Jack Gibson's work. Jack, if you're watching this, well done. Um, the whole thing, yeah, we're, we're really proud of it and I don't go back and watch a lot of my, my own stuff. Like, uh, you know, I don't really, I kind of cringe sometimes that I get things wrong or if I hear my own voice too much. But the uh, Empress video, because I didn't animate it, I'm just going back and watching Jack's stuff. And like the departure scene still makes me a little teary, you know, just and seeing the engines turning over as well. We shot that, I shot that down at the HMAS Castle Main and just seeing um, those engines turning. Here's, here's a little fun trivia. I'd love to do a behind the scenes on that documentary because there are so many things that I could talk about, but the um, the videos, uh, sorry, the engines on the Castle Main, right? Castle Main is a, is a Corvette. So you can tell those those engines are small, right? But you know, whatever, they were good for illustrative purposes. Um, 
first little bit of fun trivia and kind of like goof, if you will. The engine room telegraph says Sydney on it, right? Which obviously makes it an Australian um, ship, even though this is set in Canada in 1914, the documentary. Um, but then I realized there's actually a Sydney in, um, in Canada, which I thought was kind of funny. So maybe during a recent refit, she got her telegraph replaced with ones from, from Canada, from Sydney. But the, um, the engines, they fire on, um, compressed air. So they've got an air pump that goes. And so the engines turn like this, super slowly. So I had to film it at a really high frame rate for a prolonged period of time um, and then compress it. And I had my buddy, uh, Georgia, join, who is a who's a fan of the channel. And I was kind of like at a loose end for someone to help. So I urgently was like, hey, Georgia, can you give me a hand? Like, I need someone to help me film. So we like like lunatics were running all over this Corvette, like filming the the bridge and the engine room and all that kind of thing, which is really funny. But those engines were turning so slow. And then in editing, I sped it way up. So I had it playing at like 800% speed so that when the ship's going full speed, you can see the engines turning at kind of like normal speed, which is really funny. And then, yeah, we were like doing the engine room telegraphs. And yeah, anyway, so it all it all worked really well. But oh, oh George is in the chat. Oh, hey, dolls. And honor four X's. Oh, good to see you, Georgia. There you go. Yeah. Thanks, Georgia. That video was made. <laughs> Um, Fat Prodigy says, uh, 1990s two-part documentary, Titanic, Death of a Dream, and Legend Lives On. It's an absolutely fantastic documentary with the 90s, from the 90s, sorry, with wonderful music. Mm, brilliant. Oh, well, uh, to that end, then there was the, um, I think it was a PBS documentary called The Lost Liners. It had the Empress of Ireland, I think Lusitania, Titanic. I think it was done in uh, conjunction, I think Bob Ballard was in it. Yeah, that's a good one. Okay. Oh, um, Adele says uh, hi from Cape Breton, Nova Scotia, very close to Canada's Sydney. There you go. See? Now, ladies and gentlemen, the time has come to discuss uh, the Ocean Liner Designs contest winner. So I'm going to put myself um, above uh, this, and then I'm just going to scale myself down real quick. We're all very low tech here at Ocean Liner Designs. So, quite a few weeks ago now, unfortunately this has taken some time, but things um, got a little bit out of hand. This is one of the contestants. Um, I'm going to run through the top five real quick and um, tell you who won. But anyway, this is one of the contestants um, and I'll give you some details on uh, what is going on here. So first of all, a couple of weeks ago, I sent a brief to the Discord server and said, guys, design me a tender. I wanted a tender that could operate from Melbourne, Australia, to a fictitious ocean liner called the SS Watermark. Um, and I wanted a tender to kind of like, you know, do what we were just talking about with Nomadic, you know, ferry passengers and things out. So I said, look, go wild. It could be as big or as small as you want. Design me something. And we got back a lot of entries. And then it was a matter of um, putting it out to a vote and getting it down to the top five. And then with the top five, I put it out on YouTube opened up a voting poll and then you all voted. So we're going to run through the top five and then I'm going to reveal who won. First of all, we had the SS Stalin. So these top five are in no particular order. This was just kind of random, but this is um, by Marie Antoinette. And what is amazing about this is that it is, first of all, hand drawn with pencil. Um, love this little detail, the actual like engineering, you know, stamp. Um, Beautifully done. So the the dimensions are all there. What I really like about this is that the the it, it's really done in the spirit of like classic ocean liner plans and like the, from that era. You know what I mean? She's a she looks like a twin screw boat, and you can actually see we've got spare screws on the um, on the poop deck here, which I'm sure is a sentence that all of you will be very mature about and not giggle at. Um, you can see. Yeah, all this equipment and stuff. Like, it's it's very well done. Um, and just all the equipment is there. She looks like she's fired on steam engines by the looks of it. Is that a triple expansion, potentially? Let's have a look. I would be tank top. Yeah, it looks like we've got some steam engines. But yeah, beautifully, beautifully done. Hand-drawn, mind you. 
pretty good. Um, we had a super chat real quick from G Plug Prumelon Nye, who has said, "Hi Mike, have you considered looking into the, the Canadian Pacific ships that ran the Great Lakes? The SS Kiwatin is still around today as a museum. Second time Kiwatin has been mentioned today. I think, I think I'm gonna have to do it. I think if you guys are talking about it this much, I'm just gonna have to fly there, and, and I'm just gonna have to do it." That was your first super chat as well. Thank you very much. Yeah, the Great Lakes stuff is fascinating. I'd love to cover that in more in more detail. Well done, Marie Antoinette. Beautifully done. So that was uh, one of the contestant entries. Next, we have the SS Filigran, which is French, apparently, for watermark, which is quite funny. This was designed by... Uh, Nick, who was actually uh, one of my buddies, and um, I've known um, Nick for some time. He's a naval architect, so kind of unfair, Nick. <laughs> Entering as an actual naval architect is is a little unfair. But anyway, um, here she is. I'm going to say heavily inspired by nomadic. There's a lot of nomadic in this design, but I will also say that it's nice to see this enclosed forward end. The, um, the watermark, the ship that we put out, was like a, a, a mix between the Queen Mary and the Queen Elizabeth and just smush them together. And so this, this kind of like forward end, that's like very of the era. Um, but yeah, beautifully presented, as you can see. Very nicely done. And he's also given us a blueprint version, which is quite cool. Um, yeah, very nicely laid out. And this was absolutely... I'm going to say a fan favorite. He's even put the texture of the paper in there as if this were a real blueprint. But yeah, being a tender, and this is actually one of the things I was going to talk about Marie Antoinette. She's proportioned like a tender. You know, this is kind of like a, a big passenger ferry, basically. So um, that is absolutely proportioned like a tender. What I really like about this design, it's a very unique profile, very unique silhouette. Um, that 100% is a tender. You can see that there's passenger spaces in here. You've got couches. People are just traveling on this for maybe like half an hour. So they just want to relax, be comfy. There's bathrooms, you know. Um, it just looks like a nice big comfy boat. Uh, we know that I'm sure Filigran would have very similar kind of spaces inside. You've got a nice big passenger promenade here if they want to step out and have a smoke while they're waiting. But also these bumpers around the, the forecastle and the stern. Very similar to Nomadic. Um, nicely presented. Um, then we have the... Uh, th this was... Um, one of my favorites, this was the Johan van Alden Barnevelt 3 by Ice Monster 360. And um, first, there's like a couple of things going on here that I want to talk about. So first of all, this is like a 1960s vessel, hands down. It's maybe like 50s or 60s, but it looks very, very much like post-war. Um, beautifully done. This looks like it was done in paint, I'm going to say, and like shaded perfectly and like beautifully, beautifully illustrated. Um the the Australian flag at the stern is a nice touch. Um, just a beautifully proportioned boat. To be entirely honest with you, it's um, kind of too nice to be a tender. Like it just it could be its own passenger ship. I see this as more of like a coastal um, coastal ship running between like Melbourne and Tasmania or Melbourne and New South Wales or something. Um, yeah, I think it's too nice to be a tender. I'll be honest. Uh, the profile isn't very tenderish. It is more like a passenger ship, but eye-achingly beautiful. And yeah, this this nice little aluminium mast here. I think it is a a beautiful looking boat. Don't you think? Is she gorgeous? Even like, I really like this touch of the boot topping. So that that decorative red and then the actual color of the anti foul beneath it is a really nice touch. Very true to the era. You can imagine sitting in the water. This thing would look beautiful. So yeah, she's a beautiful ship. Um, Very nicely done. Uh, just while I've got you guys here, we had some more Super Chats come through. We had Emmett with five uh, euros. Thank you, Emmett. Road Weary says, hi, Mike. Great live stream as always. Glad I didn't miss it with a coffee emoji. I'm out of coffee now, but you're... Oh, no, I've got a tiny bit. Ah, there we go. Every drop helps. But your $10 will certainly help with more coffee. Emmett uh, with another 10 euros says, fantastic channel. Love your enthusiasm. Not even into ships, but it's great to see somebody on YouTube who is authentically into their passion and sharing it with others. Thank you, my friend. Yes, it is It is a passion. Again, you guys are the guinea pigs. You guys get to get all the all the ship um, knowledge, you know, 
And my, my parents and my friends and family at IRL get to finally relax and they don't have to worry about me spamming them with ship related stuff. For those of you just joining, this is one of the uh, contestants in the design contest that we were running to design my, my fictitious ocean liner designs line, a tender to run passengers out to our ship. So there you go. That was the Johan van Alden Barnevelt 3. Here we have the SS Copyright by Oceanic Starline. Again, beautifully proportioned. This is absolutely a tender. Hands down, you know, it is unmistakably a tender. Again, there's a little bit of nomadic in this design here, the um, tender for the White Star Line, um, but entirely unique in that the forward end of the superstructure here is enclosed. We've got a nice exposed wheelhouse up here, very true to the era. We've got a bumper here on the forecastle, so she can kind of like nestle in alongside and not get not get damaged or damage the ship. We've got the boot topping as well, so we've got a nice bright red. Very deep draft. I um the only the only thing I would point out is that for some reason she's got this extremely deep draft below the waterline. I'm not sure a tender would need that much draft, but maybe it should be super super stable because of it. Maybe you'd have like no rocking whatsoever. I remember in the the lifeboat. Uh, we, you know, Queen Mary drops her lifeboats over the side and runs them as tenders to get you ashore. And we had this unbelievable swell going to Kangaroo Island, which is a real place in Australia. There is a place in Australia called Kangaroo Island, uh, which I'm sure my American and international friends watching this would find funny. And this lifeboat was like corkscrewing and pitching. And it was just absolutely insane. Very cool. That was a very nice one. So that's by Oceanic Starline. Did a very, very nice job. I love the, uh, the paint scheme as well. It looks great. And here we have the SS Emblem by Rapier Bush uh, 82299. And uh, this was done in Minecraft. So what I like about this is we've got like the full gamut of like um, the top fives, like the full gamut of, of mediums. We've got hand-drawn. We've got Microsoft Paint. We've got, I think it was Paint. We've got uh, a CAD drawing software and now we've got Minecraft. So there are a lot of different ways of, of getting this assignment done. This is a whole ship. This is a whole ship. He's done the... Look, there's a chain locker here even for the anchor chain. We've got crew handling areas, spaces for the machinery. We've got, um, you know, an entryway here and a stairwell that runs down. We've got a cargo hatch um, as a tender from the outside um yeah i mean pretty good we've got an engine room i will say it looks absolutely monumental this looks like a huge huge ship so again maybe this is a ship worthy of being its own passenger ship you can see the um the engines all the way down here she's got it looks like triple expansion steam engines a boiler with the funnel the uptake like a ton of work went into this this is very impressive a ton of work went into all of them here's a top down view um Rapier Bush did some interiors. Very, very nice passenger lounges, like places to hang out while you're getting there. And here is uh, exterior side view. Very nicely done. Yeah, I like the, the rake to the bow. You can see how it rakes upwards like that. It should be very stable in the sea, I'm sure. Beautiful. Yeah, interesting design. You can see like these big passenger windows. Or like I assume this is maybe like a promenade that cuts in. Let's have a look. What is that? So it's about here, isn't it? Yeah, so you can see those big windows out there. So it looks like there's like a promenade and then a lounge on the inside there. Very nicely done. Um, she's flying what looks like, I think, the uh, the Australian red ensign, which is a very nice touch. That is the, exactly the kind of flag that a ship of this type would fly. So that's a very nice eye for detail. And she's flying the fictitious Ocean Liner Designs line flag. Saying, try saying that five times fast. Ocean Liner Designs line. <laughs> and we've got these big like entryway gangways here for passengers to step aboard. All in all, very nice work. So, you've seen the top five. Um, I have not picked the winner myself. This was a, a community vote. Um, I just wanted to congratulate. There was like... 20 or 30 other contestants who entered and I think I'll do a I'll try doing a video covering them all because they were all like beautifully designed they're all really cool I love seeing people respond to design prompts and going like crazy with it and coming back with all these you know like ideas and wacky designs <clears throat> so without further ado um as chosen by the YouTube 
uh, community, and I think we got like well over a thousand votes. So this was a big thing. It was a very, very close run uh, race. And I was watching it for two weeks and just seeing the, the numbers on each one changing. And like there was one that was in the lead, then another that was in the lead, then another. Um, very impressive. So obviously it was a very, very close thing. But the winner of the Ocean Liner Designs design contest is by a very, very close margin, the SS Filigrane by Mr. Nicholas Hache. Congratulations, Nick. Well done. This is beautifully designed. Um, obviously, I think people like the professional uh, finish. It looks like a real plan. Um, nailed it. Well done, Nick. And well done, everybody who entered. That was a lot of fun. We um, we do. A, well, I plan on doing a few of these things in the Discord into the future. I think uh, a lot of people had fun with it, and it was pretty cool seeing what you guys made up. So well done, and Nick, good effort again. Like just beautiful, beautiful detail. You guys know, like I spent a lot of time looking at ship plans myself for my drawings. So um, this is very nicely done. Nick, you've won yourself a print of your choice. We'll be in touch, and I will send you something in the mail shortly. Well done. What do you think, hey? Let's give him a little love in the chat. I can see you're already doing it. Bravo, Mr. Hache. Well done. Does It's a little bit unfair for a naval architect to win a <laughs> design contest. <laughs> but again, <coughs> sorry. Again, nobody could have known. Nobody knew. I didn't like write that in the, in the, um, in the contest entry or anything like that. It just, people just picked it. Anyway, well done, guys. And for the top five, well done on making it. Um, we had a super chat from Blind Guy RC 99 uh, Canadian cents. Thank you, my friend. Straight to the coffee fund, baby. Well, that was a very fast hour and 42 minutes. Goodness. James says the animation in your videos is really great. Thanks, James. That's actually all to do with Mr. Jack Gibson. His YouTube channel is Jack G Animations. If you look him up on YouTube, go and give him a like. He just put out a video about the RMS Lusitania sinking in real time. Put out a Lusitania real time sinking. It's really good. So go and give that a look. Give him a subscribe. Give him some love. Um, in the coming weeks, we're going to be doing more with Titanic Honor and Glory. Uh, we're working really close with them. They're doing some cool stuff at the moment. We're going to be using more of their content, more of their animations for our future videos. The video this weekend is going to be really good as well. Um, there is something else coming on, um, uh, like coming out that I'm working on at the moment that, um, <laughs> I have to figure out how much or how little to tell you about this because, uh, I've been working with the team on something for a little while now and haven't told anybody. I think there's actually six or seven people on the planet who know about this thing. And um, it's going to be a major announcement, essentially. So my plan is actually in two weeks from now to tell you about this in detail. Um, we're going to show you what's going on. I'm going to put up a live stream and all it's going to say is uh, major announcement. And I'm just going to have that sitting there for two weeks. I, I would love to tell you more. <coughs> all I can say is... <laughs> Uh, it is probably, hopefully, uh, I'm sure, going to blow your mind. We're all very excited to tell you. I can't really tell you much more than that. Brandon is saying, don't do it, Mike. Keep it a surprise. Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to tell you what, what it is exactly. All I'm going to say is, get hyped. We're going to have a live stream in two weeks that is going to blow you away. Talent Gaming says, are you going to tell us you're Batman? I'm Batman. <laughs> uh, Mike is personally bringing up the Titanic. Have you discovered time travel? Yes, this is actually one of Bruce Ismay's ties. I just went back in time and got off him. Katie says, hi, Mike. Watching from Illinois. Hi, Katie. We do love the Midwest here at Ocean Liner Designs. Good to hear from you. The suspense. Yeah, look. I'd love to tell you more. All I can say is, yeah, it is, it is going to um, blow your minds. So get excited. That's why we've been very busy here at Ocean Light of Design. There is a lot going on. 
Um, John says, thanks for all the wonderfully researched and spectacularly produced content. Cheers. Cheers to you, John. Very much appreciate it. Thank you very much, my friend. Well, it's been a big, big morning. Good to see you guys. I, um, usually what we do is like a ocean liner, um, fix up thing for fun that we, like we take an ocean liner or a cruise ship that looks like it could maybe do with some love. I think we, we might've uh, run out of time a little bit because it's been, yeah, it's been a long stream, but bearing in mind again, we haven't got to talk a lot because I've been, you know, obviously a lot's been going on and I haven't been able to do a live stream again. So yeah, this week we'll be going back to posting our regularly posted stuff. We're very excited to bring you some videos, but it's been good to see you. Lime says, did you buy the Cunard line? <laughs> yes. Keep sending through money for the coffee fund. It's actually the purchase Cunard line fund. <laughs> uh, I was good to see you guys. Promise you next time we'll do an ocean liner um, or cruise ship repair video redesign. Um, and we'll have a little more fun with it. <laughs> I should live more. Oh, I hope you guys enjoyed it. Yeah, I, you know, you guys have great questions. You always keep me on my toes. There are some questions tonight or today that just totally threw me. <laughs> you did a good job. All right. Oh, the Enforcer says, great to see you on a live stream. I usually watch your uh, videos to wind down after running my live streams. Thank you for the amazing research. Thank you, my friend. Imagine watching a live stream after doing a live stream. Although I know what you're talking about. You know, when you like, you do a live stream and you've been talking nonstop well like like i have you talk nonstop for like two hours and you just kind of need to like cool down a little bit afterwards that's very cool my friend thank you so much for joining in um for those of you who don't know the enforcer um the enforcer does a lot of like military videos um he's got a really cool youtube channel um go and check him out yeah it's just some interesting stuff it's like a current current events and reporting i think is how you you would bill it isn't that right enforcer but lovely to see you thanks for Thanks for stopping by. How cool. Well, look, guys. Until next time, stay safe and stay happy, as always. And I'll see you again soon. Thanks so much for joining in. Love you all. Have a great week. And we'll talk again very, very soon. Have a good week. Bye-bye.